To say that intellect is socially constructed is not to say that there are no differences in cognitive development. But just as we have come to understand that we do not derive attributions of race straightforwardly from skin color, so we do not derive attributions of intellect straightforwardly from cognitive skills. Indeed, cognitive skills are as elusive as skin color and evade measurement just as much. The notion of a measurable intelligence quotient or the idea that any test of specific skills can measure intellect in some general sense is itself part of how our contemporary understanding of intellect has been constructed. There are many people who find it hard to reason, to employ logic, to problem solve, to grasp abstract ideas, to perform a variety of academic skills, and so on. But we must be extremely cautious about judgments we make about others' abilities. We can see if someone is able to demonstrate specific skills in the way we demand in a specific test, but we cannot legitimately jump from that to judgments about her overall intelligence. Furthermore, we have to be aware of the ways in which we are making assumptions about motor skills. For example, we may assume that moving blocks is a basic motor skill, so we test for an understanding of quantity by asking someone to pick out three blocks from a pile. But if the motor skills involved are too difficult for that person, and he does not do as we request, then we assume that he does not know how to count. We have to eliminate many other possibilities before we can accurately conclude that a person does not know how to count. And then we cannot assume that it is impossible for him to learn to count until we have tried many different approaches, not just the typical approach, to helping him learn. We also have to recognize ways in which the skills we look for are culturally and socially specific and understand that not having certain skills is only a problem in certain contexts. Many students waste hours of time learning to tie shoes, a difficult motor operation that is often used as a measure of intellectual accomplishment in an age of Velcro fasteners. And we have to avoid jumping to conclusions about someone never being able to learn a certain skill. If it is a skill that is useful for him to learn, we should keep trying to help him learn it. But we also should not delay introducing other skills on the basis that he'll never be able to do this if he hasn't learned to do that. You do not need to know how to read in order to work on developing problem-solving skills, for example. We also have to be careful about assumptions about what skills are useful for a particular person. For example, if we have already decided that a person has little cognitive ability, we may assume that he does not need to learn to read. But this is, again, bringing in questionable assumptions. And if someone is having a difficult time reading, which is often due to motor and sensory processing difficulties, as reading requires a lot of effort in these areas, so much so that for many people, no energy or attention remains to appreciate the meaning of the text, that it does not follow that she will not enjoy or be able to make academic use of text in audio form. Furthermore, the construction of intellect is bound up with the construction of what counts as communication. People who consider themselves to possess intelligence attribute intellect to others based on how they communicate. When a person cannot understand another easily or follow his thought processes, or the latter does not give the former the answers she expects to certain kinds of questions, she concludes from that that he has cognitive deficits. Yet, if she recognized the ways in which she is failing to communicate with him by not adapting herself to his mode of communication, his language use, and his pace, or by failing to appreciate his behaviors, gestures, and glances as communication, she might find that he is not so unable to communicate after all. She might realize that what she took as his lack of communicative skill, and hence evidence of his cognitive deficit, is really her lack of communicative skill. Once we understand that the notion of intellect is constructed through assumptions about what counts as communication and what skills people must demonstrate before they are granted access to opportunities for development, 
we can understand that what disables people who are labeled as intellectually impaired is, first, an environment in which a successful or full life is defined in limited terms based on notions of independence from others and competitive accomplishment. And second, an environment in which people who are not independent or successful in these narrowly defined ways are therefore deprived of the opportunity to challenge themselves developmentally, participate as citizens, use their skills and talents to make contributions to society in ways that are beneficial and meaningful to them, and enjoy full protection of their rights.